Thank you very much for inviting me. I very much appreciate a lecturing to you. I hope to be able to come in person at some point to give a lecture. It's a wonderful place and a wonderful institute that you have. <clears throat> and the history and of law and culture in the Levant is an extremely important area for us all to study. It's particularly important in Jewish legal history because this was the crucible where much developed and the history of Jewish law is until relatively recently to a great extent the history of law everywhere. Um, to understand the process of codification of Jewish law requires that we tell a much longer story than the 1400s. And we're going to spend the beginning part of this lecture discussing how we got to the 1400s, what everything looked like until the 1400s, and what changed, and then what didn't change, and allow us to reflect on how much the transition from the 1400s to the 1600s irrevocably changed Jewish law and maybe many other legal systems that coexisted around Jewish law. Although the Bible, the Torah, reads like a code, it's not at all a code and was never understood to be a law code in the Jewish tradition Many important topics are left out. Many trivial topics are discussed in great detail. And many very important topics are discussed in just a sentence. The first attempt at true codification of Jewish law takes place around the year zero in a document that we now call the Mishnah. The Mishnah is an organization of Jewish law into six different volumes, logically organized in a topical form. So there's a volume called family law, and one volume in, in the subdivision of family law is called divorce, and another is called marriage, and another is called prenuptial agreements. And they're more or less organized by topic and analytically. And at first glance, when you hear that, you say, oh, that's a law code. Jewish law has an ancient tradition of law codes that's about 2,000 years old. But that would be mistaken. The Mishnah is not a code at all. It is closer to a codex which is it merely records all the reasonable opinions on a topic without, in fact, telling you directly or frequently, even indirectly, which view is correct. The Mishnah frequently confronts more than one problem with more than one opinion, and it leaves out opinions that were clearly viable as well. The Mishnah is an organizational structure for rethinking about Jewish law, but in no way, shape, or form does it look like a code, because codes have one correct answer to every hard problem, and they do not leave most issues open. Um, the Mishnah, in fact, leaves most issues open and it's not unusual for the Mishnah to quote three, four, five, or even six viable approaches to a single topic. Nobody who's learned Mishnah would think of Mishnah as a code. And indeed, the Talmud, or even the two Talmuds that are commentaries on the Mishnah, understand that the Mishnah is far from a code, and they instead use the Talmud as a free-ranging, broad and wide way to analyze Jewish law in its many different forms, 
And the Talmud is even further from a code than the Mishnah. The Talmud is closer to a discussion group. Many different views are shared, running from a period of about 500 years. It's ahistorical, and it does not codify. Every once in a while, the Talmud will stop to tell us this view is wrong, and even more rarely, the Talmud will stop to tell us this view is correct. But the Talmud reads much more like a conversation than it does a code. And there's no way to read the Talmudic commentary on the Mishnah and think that the Talmudic rabbis were at all interested in a codification document. The Talmud ceased being written in the middle of the 6th century, and it was closed, but not codified. And while the closers of the Talmud occasionally, in about 5% of the disputes, noted the correct view, in more than 95% of the disputes in the Talmud, we have no idea what is the normative rule or sometimes the Talmud will discuss seven different opinions, and when you're finished with a Talmudic discussion, five will be left viable, two will be discarded. But that doesn't make something a code either. A code is a document that in almost all cases leaves the law with only one correct opinion. The Talmud in its many pages rarely codifies Jewish law down to a single opinion. The Talmud is far from a law code. The Jewish law scholars who came after the Talmud, known as the Gaonim, um, literally the great ones, they lived in Babylonia, the same place the Talmud was written, and they continued the Talmudic discussion of diverse opinions. There were many Geonim, many different rabbinic leaders. They freely disagreed with each other, but yet they occasionally saw the need to develop law codes for things that the community needed done rapidly, efficiently, and with a consensus of scholars. So, for example, the Gaonim wrote a book on how to process loan documents that if you looked at, you would say, oh, this is a code book on how to make commercial loans, how to seek commercial loans, and how to collect commercial loans. It looks like a code book, and it serves the purpose of allowing merchants to easily access credit. And it serves the purpose of allowing bankers to easily provide credit. It clearly served the function of a code book. But even though the Gaonim were aware of the value of code books in some areas. In most areas of Jewish law, the Gaonim carefully and directly did not codify. They chose not to write code books or horn books or law books that were confined to a single opinion. And only in a few areas where the virtues of single codification is obvious, did the Gaonim understand the actual purpose of a code book and set out to write code books. So, for example, in the area of communal prayer, they wrote communal prayer books, which serve the purpose of a code book. Obviously, when many of us get together to pray, in a single synagogue, there's great virtue to handing all of us the same prayer book. 
and make sure that we're each not praying out loud different things. But in many other areas of Jewish law, and indeed most areas of Jewish law, no code books were needed and no code books were ever entered into. Again, by the era of the Gaonim, by the end of the era of the Gaonim, which concludes around with the sack of Babylonia around the year 860, we could say with some level of confidence that noticeably less than 10% of Jewish law was codified. And now the Jewish community dramatically disperses. The sack of Babylonia produces the great Jewish diaspora. A small community remains in Babylonia and spreads to Iran. Another community moves to Israel, a relatively small community. A significant community moves to North Africa and what we now call Southern Spain, but which was all under Islamic law. And a substantial Jewish community moves into Southern Europe and slowly but incrementally moves further up into Europe, traveling what we assume is in both directions, up through the Italian peninsula on one hand, and from Spain into France, and then into Germany on the other hand. But along the way, a great journey of codification takes place. We will see that ultimately this journey of codification fails and does not produce the great codification of the 1400s, but it is a fascinating side journey on the beginnings of codification. Rabbi Yitzchak of Fez, who's called in the Jewish community Rabbi Yitzchak Al-Fazi, Rabbi Yitzchak who lives in Fez. Fez is a city in what we now call Morocco, writes the first full and complete law code. And he does it by writing nothing. It's the most fascinating law code. He picks up a black marker and a Talmud. He writes very few words. He crosses everything out from the Talmud, which is wrong. And he leaves a Talmudic code in which there is an abbreviated Talmud and the abbreviations entail crossing out everything which is wrong. As I've said to you, the Talmud has stories and multiple opinions and much Agadic, non-legal literature. And Rabbi Alfasi, the Rif, takes his many volumes of Talmud and a black felt marker, and he crosses out everything in the Talmud which is either not law intrinsically, i.e. its stories or conversation, or it intends to be law, but in his judgment is wrong. He's left with a dramatically abbreviated Talmud. Indeed, it goes by the term an abbreviated Talmud. It is, in fact, a law code. Since everything that's in it is intended to be legal, and everything that's left out of it is intended to either be non-legal or wrong, you had a high degree of confidence that Rabbi Alfasi knew he was and intended to write a law code. When you add to this that Rabbi Alfasi occasionally moved topics from a place that was off point to a place that was on point, Rabbi Alfasi created the first nearly full and complete law code. If you knew where the topic was codified, you could figure out what Jewish law, as understood by Rabbi Alfasi, was. He organized it 
along the organizational structure of the Talmud, which was, he acknowledges and we acknowledge even more profoundly, somewhat haphazard, and it made finding material difficult because sometimes the primary Talmudic discussion of a topic would be in a place that you wouldn't expect it to be, and he would leave it there. Rabbi Alfasi's leading disciple was a figure named the Rimi Gash, who we know very little about, except that the Rimi Gash had a leading disciple named Rambam or Maimonides. Maimonides is without a doubt the leading light of the Jewish era in the medieval period. And Maimonides says, Rabbi Alfasi's law code is a great idea, but it can be done one better. And Maimonides, the Rambam, writes the first full and complete Jewish law code called the Mishnah Torah. It is not organized around the Talmud. Maimonides codifies all of Jewish law into... 14 books, about 60 sub books, and exactly a thousand chapters. And in this thousand chapter book, he codifies all of Jewish okay. law and he makes it clear that every single part of Jewish law. <laughs> Normative and non-normative is to be codified, and he faithfully codifies it organizationally, structurally, as if the Talmud does not exist. It does not follow the Talmudic organization. It follows a self-standing organization by topic. So there's an area called family law, and it begins with marriage and ends with divorce. And you encounter topics as you would logically encounter them in the course of your marriage. Things are topically organized in a beautiful way. Maimonides' code also codifies things that would only normally be codified if the temple were rebuilt. He codifies all of Jewish law both the relevant and the irrelevant, tort law, commercial law, temple law, high priest law, everything, even things that have not been practiced for centuries. Maimonides writes the first only full and complete law code. Nobody writes a work like it until well past 1800, close to 1900, when Rabbi Yechiel Michal Epstein, who dies in Novartic in Eastern Europe, writes another code almost a thousand years later. Maimonides' code is unmatched, leaves everybody awestruck. And then are you ready for the good news? is discarded. Maimonides' law code, impressive as it is, enters into the scholarly universe with a great deal of admiration and a thud. Nobody uses it as a law code. People use it to study abstract Jewish law, but it's too cumbersome a work to actually use for functional Jewish law. And although it's a fascinating magnum opus, and Maimonides is the leading scholar of Jewish law, it quickly is labeled a hard-to-use work for scholars only. And this is true, even though it's written in simple Mishnaic Hebrew, easy to understand and well-organized, because Maimonides codifies war rules that are not relevant until the Messiah arrives and the temple is rebuilt, 
There's too much work to do. There is no follow-up on Maimonides' code. It's, it's admired and dropped. And indeed, simultaneous with Maimonides' code, in Europe, in what we now call northern Germany, northern France, southern Germany, the Alsace-Lorraine area, which wouldn't have identified itself as German or French. And I know I'm being ahistorical by calling it Germany or France, because they would have denied that they were French. French is what it was in Paris, and they were not Parisian, and they were not German. German is what it was in Frankfurt, and they were not Frankfurtians. But nonetheless, we will look at them and say they were in the Franco-German Alsace-Lorraine area. A grand school of Jewish law develops around a profound Jewish law scholar named Rabbi Shlomo Yitzchaki, who we call Rashi, an acronym. Just like Rambam, Rabbi Moshe ben Maimon is an acronym. Rashi, Rabbi Shlomo Yitzchaki, is an acronym, an abbreviation. And this abbreviation becomes a great scholar. And Rashi writes a commentary on the Talmud. He does not write a law code, and he insists that normative Jewish law should revolve around the wide-open Talmudic text. He plays no favorites in his Talmudic commentary between those opinions that are correct or incorrect. He comments on them all. He almost never tells you who's correct and who's incorrect. And he widens rather than shrinks Torah, leaving you with the impression that every opinion is viable. And his grandchildren, who we call the Tosafists, Tosafot means additions, and they're not just his grandchildren, they're his intellectual heirs. He started a yeshiva, a study hall, and his children and grandchildren and children-in-law studied even more study halls. They developed great schools of Jewish law who wrote expansive commentaries on the Talmud, intending to expand rather than contract the Talmud. Tosvot, as we call them, these schools of thought, this combined school of thought of Rashi, Rashi's descendants and heirs and intellectual companions, expands the whole of Torah. So when Rashi encounters a Talmudic text, Rashi and Tosafot provide two or three different competing explanations for the Talmudic text, each of which they think are viable. And when they Note for you that there are two or three Talmudic texts that are somewhat in tension. They will attempt to resolve this tension sometimes in four or five different ways. So it starts with three Talmudic opinions. By the time Rashi and Tosot are done with it, they sometimes will have six or seven or eight viable Talmudic opinions. And by the year 1300, I might have five or six different reasonable, equally viable ways to understand Jewish law in Eastern Europe. Schools of thought developed with robust alternative opinions of Jewish law, each reasonable and each coexisting with the other, and each existing in a bubble of viability, and the community having countless diverse opinions, each of which it can rely on, and each of which it can function with. Needless to say, this produced disjointed practice. So that when I went from community to community, 
Every community in the Jewish tradition reads Torah Saturday morning. But if I went from synagogue to synagogue in Cairo in the 1200s, I found different synagogues read different things. And they had competing calendarial cycles. And the same thing was true in Europe. And if I ask, Jewish law prohibits leavened bread on Passover. And the Talmud tells us that leavened bread is a mixture of water and flour. So I've got a great idea. Can I mix flour with milk? Is that edible on Passover or does that make it leaven as well? Some communities said, of course, that's leaven. Some communities said, of course, that's not leaven. And some communities said it's worse than that. It's super leaven. It becomes um, uh, prohibited to use automatically faster than water does because milk has sugar and proteins that make it even super leaven. And diversity of opinions and practice predominated. There was unity of purpose without uniformity of practice at all. The Crusades come, and a great Jewish scholar named Rabbi Asher ben Yechiel, who also, we like acronyms in the Jewish tradition, he goes by his acronym, the Rush, Rabbi Asher ben Yechiel, the Rush. He moves to Toledo, Spain, from Germany, from the school of Rashi, fully equipped with all of Rashi's scholarship with him, and he encounters in Spain all of the scholarship of Maimonides and the Rif, Rabbi Alfasi, and he's living at the crossroads. And he says, my, this is exceptionally interesting. I'm living at the crossroads of three great schools of thought. I'm living at the crossroads of the North African community and the crossroads of the Northern European community. And there's a separate and independent Spanish Barcelona community that is existing as well. He, of course, didn't call them Spanish. I know I'm being ahistorical here as well. It's just convenient for you and me to say, if you lived in Languedoc, in Barcelona and Marseille, um, you're Spanish or French, but actually you and I both know that the Barcelona-Marseille community thought they were independent of Spain and independent of France, and they considered themselves Languedocian. Um, and they had their own unique Christian community of Cothers and their own unique Jewish community as well. And they had their own unique rabbinic traditions. And Rabbi Asher ben Yechiel, who lives in central Spain, has all of these communities in front of him. And he starts sorting through these communities. And he starts telling you who's correct and who's incorrect. And he starts the grand project of codification around the year 1300, where he tells you what view he thinks is correct. Had Rabbi Asher ben Yechiel's project come to fruition, Jewish law in the 1300s might have had a law code. He is forsaken by his community, and the leading forsaker of his approach is just to let you know you can never trust anybody. His own son, who's the leading scholar of the community and who inherits his father, abandons the enterprise of codifying correct Jewish law and says, it is beyond my ability to determine what is correct and incorrect. I will move instead to the model of the Mishnah. And I will help my father's project by organizing Jewish law into unique organizational models 
But I will not codify right from wrong. I will just organize opinions so that you can find in a nice volume all viable opinions. My father's opinion, um, Maimonides' opinion, the Rift's opinion, Rashi's opinion, Tosis' opinion, but I'm not going to tell you who's right or who's wrong. And when you ask me what I do, I'm going to smile sweetly and tell you this is my father's opinion and we should all follow my father because he's my father. But it's the weakest endorsement possible. He doesn't ever tell you right from wrong. He says to you, this is my father's view, so I follow it. It's the weakest endorsement you could imagine. But he enormously contributes to Jewish law because he understands what's wrong with Maimonides' code. He leaves out from codification of Jewish law everything that you don't need to know until the Messiah arrives or until the temple is rebuilt. And thus, he stops wasting his time and energy on any aspect of Jewish law which is not normative. He gets Jewish law down to four neat volumes. He publishes a book of law called Arba'a Turim, the four pillars of Jewish law. One is family law. One is commercial law. One is ritual law. And one is daily law, Sabbath law, festival law, as opposed to pure ritual law like food law and slaughter law. And when you ask him, what about the temple law? He says, temple shmemple. Who cares about the temple? The temple doesn't exist, and I'm not going to waste my time worrying about any aspect of Jewish law that is not relevant in the real world. This tradition of the tour takes deep hold. Nobody writes full and complete law codes anymore, and nobody pays any attention to the few law codes that exist. And the tour, Rabbi, um, Rabbi Yaakov, uh, Rabbi Yaakov, the Arbator of Rabbi Yaakov ben Yechiel, becomes not a code, but like the Mishnah, a codex, a codification of all viable opinions. And if Jewish law had stopped developing at that moment, we would have been left where exactly where we started with a Mishnah. But Jewish law disappears in Spain. Due to the rise of Christian Spain, the Jews start leaving Spain. The expulsion from Spain comes in 1492, but that's the end of a downward slope. The Jews start leaving Spain and moving to the Middle East a hundred years earlier, maybe even 150 years earlier. By the year 1350, the handwriting is on the wall that the Jews in Spain and Barcelona and Languedoc are on a downward spiral, and smart money and smart people are leaving. And a substantial Jewish community moves to Israel. But I don't mean modern Israel. But when I use the term Israel in this lecture, I essentially mean northern Israel all the way through Turkey. So even though there is an astonishingly small number of Jews in Jerusalem and a small number of Jews in Ashdod and Ashkelon and a small number of Jews, I am sure, along the coastal cities, the dominant Jewish city is in northern Israel called Tzfat. And Tzfat reaches northward all the way to Constantinople. So when I ask 
for where is the Jewish community? They don't deny that Jerusalem is God's capital. But there are only a few thousand Jews living in Jerusalem, and they are a poor and impoverished Jewish community. When I ask you for the name of the leading scholar of the Jewish community in the year 1500, I have to tell you as follows. We do not know the name of a single rabbi living in Jerusalem in the year 1500. I'm not denying to you that they existed. I'm sure they were along every street. But there were few great scholars. Ask me for great scholars in Ashkelon. I don't know any. Ask me for great scholars living in Tzvat in the year 1500, and I can give you 10. And ask me for great scholars living north of Tzvat all the way to Constantinople, and from the year 1400 to the year 1600, I can give you 50. And if you said to me, no, that's wrong, I could say you're right. I could, on an hour's preparation, give you a hundred. And if you told me maybe that's wrong, I would say, okay, give me a day, and I could give you two hundred. Um, great rabbis were, I don't want to say a dime a dozen, because that diminishes them, but, but they were. And they elected as their head. Rabbi Joseph Caro, who in the year 1530 writes the Grand Code of Jewish Law called the Shulchan Aruch, the Sect Table. And this is a law code. Rabbi Caro says, I am going to boil every single dispute in Jewish law down to one. Correct opinion. Maybe every once in a while, on less than 5% of the matters, I will acknowledge my inability to boil Jewish law down to one opinion, and I will give you two opinions and tell you which is the better opinion, the one you should follow. Rare is the moment where Rabbi Caro gives you two equal opinions, and he never gives you more than two, and inevitably when he gives you two opinions, he tells you which one is better. There are no more than 10 cases in his whole law code with 10,000 disputes resolved where he gives you two opinions equally viable, and each of them are of matters that are insignificant to law but our central questions of custom. Matters of custom, you could well imagine a codifier saying, you know what? Here are two viable customs. But even that, he refused to do. He codified the right rule. He wrote a code. If you opened it and read it, you would say, oh, I've got here a law code. Every dispute is resolved down to one viable opinion. I know exactly what to do. Jewish law is codified. And we understand the law, culture, and civilization that produced that was this unique cultural milieu in Northern Israel, what we now call Syria, which is the same incredible ahistorical moment, and Lebanon, an even more ahistorical moment, and even, I'll call it Istanbul, since I'm going to be ahistorical, Constantinople, that produced a, a model of codification that became endemic in both Jewish and Islamic law. Rabbi Caro understood from the culture around him that what Jewish law needed was 
a law code. And not only did they want a law code, they attempted to build a hierarchical Judaism. They agreed that they would create one chief rabbi and recreate the grand model of the Sanhedrin in which every dispute would be resolved by a small collection of great scholars voting. And minority opinions would be worth nothing. You could no more follow a minority opinion than you could follow a wrong opinion. Minority opinions were wrong. That was the law, culture, and civilization that led to the codification of Jewish law in the Levant and Middle East. It was an enormously powerful moment so that when Rabbi Caro dies by the year 1550, he thinks that he has changed Jewish law in an unchangeable way, which is Jewish law is going to have one opinion that everybody is going to follow. And at the time that he died, for one brief shining moment, in northern Israel, Syria, to be a historical, Lebanon and Turkey up to Constantinople, we could say Jewish law had one correct view. It was the view of Rabbi Caro, and it was codified as the only view. Let me assure you that that was not how Jewish law developed in Eastern Europe. Eastern Europe was going through its Protestant moment. And Rabbi Moshe Isserlis, a pen pal of Rabbi Caro, they're writing each other letters from Prague to Svat. Back and forth, looks up and says, this is not the way Jewish law functions. And he writes glosses on Rabbi Caro's wonderful law code highlighting the differences between European Jewry and Sephardic Jewry, the Jewry in northern Israel, Syria, and Turkey, noting that the Jewry in Eastern Europe not only doesn't follow this view, but follows a variety of views. And Rabbi Isserlis, unlike Rabbi Caro, steadfastly refuses to codify. He frequently says, Jewish law will have six views. Here are three good practices. Do one of them. And not only that, his intellectual descendants write codes upon codes of Jewish law, each one presenting an alternative view so that by the year 1650, I know I've exceeded my time period by 50 years, Jewish law has 15 law codes or 15 commentaries on the Shulchan Aruch with Rabbi Isserlis's glosses, each of which represent countless diverse opinions on Jewish law. And the process of codification is producing a process of decodification. What is codified is an organizational structure. What is not codified is a single rule. Rabbi Caro imagined that we're going to have a single rule of Jewish law. And I want to share with you, in the last 40 years in Israel, Rabbi Joseph Caro's dream was revived. So that which you think is dead is never dead. Rabbi Ovadia Yosef, the chief rabbi of Israel for many years, and now his son, Rabbi Yitzchak Yosef, the current Sephardic chief rabbi of Israel, have presented an elaborate argument. 
to return to the model of codification. And they have been leading the charge of codification for the last 50 years in Israel, arguing that what Jewish law needs is a return to the model of codification found in the Levant, found in the Middle East from 1450 to 1600, in which everybody is instructed to follow a single correct opinion, and the, syring the single correct opinion should be the opinion of Rabbi Caro, found in the Shulchan Aruch. And if you step into modern Israeli Sephardic law, you will see a process of recodification. The law, culture, and civilization that led to the codification of Jewish law from the 1400s to the 1600s is not dead. Not only is it not dead, it merely went to sleep. It slept from the year 1600 to the year 2000. A long nap. A 400 year nap. But the process of codification of Jewish law that took place in northern Israel, Syria, Turkey, Lebanon. I know I'm being ahistorical, and you're all smiling at my ahistorical use of geographical terms, but that's the world we function in. <clears throat> we don't call it the Levant anymore. We don't even call it the Middle East, because we can't imagine anymore a Jewish community running from northern Israel through Syria and Lebanon to Turkey. You can't even drive from northern Israel to Damascus. You can't walk. You can't drive. All you can do is shoot missiles from northern Israel to Syria and the other way around. Um, but nonetheless, for 150 years, there was a grand law code in northern Israel, the Levant, all the way through Turkey, that codified Jewish law in a magnificent single opinion, that culture disappeared from the secular universe. Neither the Islamic world nor the secular legal world believes in this process of codification. But Jewish law has revived the process of codification since around the year 1980 and has gone through a vigorous codificatory moment from the year 1980, give or take, to the, 20, to the current generation, led by first Rabbi Ovadia Yosef and then by his children and grandchildren, who are out there every day preaching the virtues of codification. The current chief rabbi argues every day for a law code. And so do his brothers and his children and his nephews and his community. They argue that Rabbi Caro got it right. The code of the, the culture of codification is the right culture. And what Jewish law needs is a pope, a chief rabbi, a code, and a process of codification. And the golden era of Judaism, they argue, was the process of law, culture, and civilization that led to the codification of Jewish law from 1400 to 1550 in the Levant. And the Levant is not what we now call Israel. It's Israel from Safat all the way to Istanbul. The current geographical maps 
do it in injustice. They portray the Levant as modern Israel or Israel plus Syria and Lebanon and Turkey. But actually, this process of codification by the year 1600 had entered all the way into Greece and the Balkans and parts of what we now call Italy and Macedonia and significant parts of what we now call Southern Europe were part of the Jewish Levant. Prague was not. Prague was comfortably in Eastern Europe and never codified. But significant parts of the Jewish community, of the broadly speaking Levant, from not just the Middle East, and indeed excluding Yemen, and excluding significant parts of Iran, which were never part of Rabbi Caro's jurisdiction. The Jewish community that Rabbi Caro codified ran from Safat to Aleppo to Istanbul um, to Macedonia to Venice um, and up into the Balkans, which were Sephardic until World War II, when Hitler killed all Jews, Ashkenaz, or Sephard. The Holocaust drew none of the distinctions we would draw. The Holocaust killed Jews of every ethnicity. But the Levant's codification from 1400 to 1550 codified significant segments of the Jewish population. It did not codify Yemen. It did not codify what we now call Iran. But it codified enormous parts of what we might even now call European Jewry. The Balkans, Greece, Northern Italy, um, these were all under Rabbi Caro's jurisdiction. And this process of codification still exists in Israel. It took a hiatus. It took a break um, for many years. But if you think that what I'm discussing today is ancient history, you miss how significant a cultural movement there is today in Israel to codify Rabbi Yitzchak Yosef is writing a law code. It's a code. It has only one law. Um, very rarely does he codify more than one opinion. And this is an important idea. Santiana tells us that if you don't learn from the past, you will not understand the present. And you are doomed to repeat it, the mistakes of the past. This is certainly true in our topic. The process of codification from the year 1400 to the year 1550 is being repeated today in Jerusalem, in Tel Aviv, in parts of Brooklyn, in significant segments of the community. It might become normative. And it's certainly much more normative in the Sephardic community than it is anywhere else where there's a significant push to have one and only one correct opinion. So we have discussed today an opinion in the past that is an opinion about the future. And this opinion allows us to understand the past. And by understanding the past, we understand the future. Thank you all very much. And I'm open to questions. I'd welcome any questions any of you have. Thank you all for being such a wonderful audience.